Imagine I gave you a time machine, and you could choose any date in the past or the future. Where would you go to? This was a question I was asked, and I, at first I thought, well, given what we've learned in the last 400 years, just imagine what's possible in the future, 400 years from now, or 10,000 years from now. Let's go there and see what it's like. But then on second thoughts, you might get there to the future and you find that humans have been assimilated by robots, which, well, maybe that's not so much fun after all. Or even worse, you get to the future and we've really messed things up and there's no life at all. So I'll play it safe with my time machine. I'll go back two and a half thousand years. I'll go back to have a conversation with Democritus. Democritus was a philosopher. Many historians of science say he was the first real scientist. He made the remarkable advance that the world could be understood with logic, thought, and experiment, rather than just appealing to the gods and magic. Only fragments of his writings remain, but I'd like to tell you about four topics he wrote about. I would like to go back and show Democritus what we've learned about his predictions and tell him what we've learned from science. He looked at the matter around him and he studied it and he speculated that everything was made of particles so small you can't see them. He called them atoms. Now, I can't show Democritus a picture of an atom, a photograph of an atom. But at first I would show him the PhD thesis of Albert Einstein. He graduated from the University of Zurich in 1905, that's the cover of his thesis, and you might think it would be for the discoveries about space and time and relativity, but no. It's 17 short pages, beautiful pages of physics and mathematics, that describe how to measure the sizes of molecules. His theory was applied. On the image there, you see some jittering particles. That's Brownian motion. Those are very small specks of pollen floating on water, jittering around because they're being bombarded by the molecules in the water. And from the random path they make, you could use the work that Einstein laid out in his thesis to calculate the size of the water molecules. And indeed, 100 years ago, it was shown that the molecules were smaller than the wavelength of light. So you can't actually shine a light onto them to take a photograph. But I could show Democritus this. This is the first image of a molecule that was made actually in 2009 by researchers at IBM Zurich. They used what is called an atomic force microscope, which is like a, a mechanical, very fine slither of material that is pushed across the molecule with a laser, and it has little sensors, piezoelectric sensors on it. And they can move this around the molecule in three dimensions, picking up its charge field. And from that, you can make the image on the top there, which corresponded exactly to those sort of diagrams you learn about in chemistry. Quite beautiful. But what's at the center of those connecting places there, the atoms. Well, that I could also show to Democritus, because just a few years ago, researchers in the Netherlands and Germany, they built a quantum microscope. This was the first picture of an atom, a hydrogen atom, that was made in 2013. Quantum microscopes are a pretty complicated thing, but what you're looking at here is, is a picture made up by ejecting the electrons out of the hydrogen atom, looking at where they fall onto a detector and reconstructing how, where they came from. And what you're seeing there is really the wave function, the probability function of where the electrons can be found. It's quite different to those sort of planetary orbit type pictures that I was taught in school, at least. Now, Democritus might wonder where all of these atoms came from, and 
Prior to this year, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question, but there was a remarkable event that took place some months ago. For one minute, the fabric of space vibrated, stretched and expanded. It was picked up by gravitational wave detectors in, in Europe and America. A rough location could be identified as to this source that was disturbing space-time. And astronomers all around the world focused their telescopes into that region, and they saw an explosion of light decaying away from some cosmic event that had occurred. That blue dot there is shining with the light of a billion stars. What it comes from is a merger between two neutron stars. This is an artist's representation. Neutron stars are what's left over when a giant star collapses at the end of its life, and its core condenses into a very dense state of neutrons. Now, what's this all got to do with atoms? Well, it was found that in these mergers between dead stars, this is where the heavier elements are actually created. Before this observation, we were missing part of the puzzle as to where atoms came from. And now we have a complete picture. We can look at the periodic table of atoms and say where everything came from. This is it here. So the hydrogen in your bodies, about 20% of you, originates in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. That's how old most of you are. <laughs> There's no other source of hydrogen since then. The oxygen in your bodies was made in exploding supernova massive stars at the end of their lives. And then some of the trace elements that we would be dead without, like iodine. There's only a few grams in, in our bodies, but we can't live without it. That was all made in the exploding neutron stars. Quite a story. Quite an accomplishment of science to figure out the origin of all these elements. The next thing Democritus talked about was the night sky. He speculated that the stars that glowed were actually distant suns, like our sun. He couldn't prove that because there were no telescopes at this time. So I'd like to go back and show him a telescope. I would like to show him one of the most beautiful images ever taken. This is by the Hubble Space Telescope. So I will just step out the way because you can just watch this and I'll comment over a little bit of it. I can't show Democritus our own galaxy because we're in the middle of it, but I can show him Andromeda, which is our nearest neighbor. It contains hundreds of billion stars like our own Milky Way. This image is a composite of many pointings of the Hubble Space Telescope. To show the whole image, you would need 600 of these screens. So what you're seeing are close to a billion stars. And I, at least, am not used to seeing a billion things, but here, by scanning over this image, you can get a sense of scale of a single galaxy. One of the next predictions that Democritus made was that there should be planets out there in space, like the Earth. And that is one of the most remarkable accomplishments that we've actually made in astronomy in the last century, I think, is the discovery that nearly all of the stars we see in the night sky have their own planets orbiting them. I'll get back in a minute to describe how we've understood that. This song I actually wrote, it's from my last album, I wrote it for my wife, I hope you like it. I always, you know, I've been looking at these images for 30 years as an astrophysicist, and I always, it always makes me feel so small and, and the insignificance, but also it fills me with this awe about how amazing the universe actually is. We've learned so much, but there's still an awful long way to go to really understand some of the complicated things, like why there is something and not nothing. So each of these little pixels contains a star. Some are like the sun, some are smaller, some larger. We're scanning through to the center of Andromeda. 
and then the end of the movie will zoom out. So how, how did Democritus come up with the idea that there are planets orbiting these stars? I would like to ask him that. It's quite a remarkable prediction he made. And as I mentioned, we've learned that most stars out there in our galaxy have their own worlds orbiting them. How do we know that? Well, it's, one technique is, is quite simple, and it's the most commonly used technique to find planets around other worlds. And here's a little example of how, how we do that. If the alignment is just right, that planet will orbit in front of the star. This is an example of Venus transiting the sun. And our telescopes are not powerful enough to see the planets themselves. They're too small and too faint. But the planet has a small size, and it blocks out some of the starlight. And in the graph, you can see the intensity of light when the sun drops by a tenth of a percent. So by looking for these dips in starlight, we can find planets orbiting other worlds. And by the amount that the light dips, we can figure out how big the planet is that's blocking the starlight. Putting all the few thousand planets together that have been discovered so far onto one plot, it looks like this. This is a, an orrery. These are all real planetary systems observed around stars in our galaxy. The diversity was quite shocking to astronomers because there, there was so much variety in the number of configurations of solar systems out there. there are, some were like our own, with planets orbiting at the same distance from their stars. Others were quite different. You had all the planets orbiting within the distance of Mercury. There are planets orbiting binary stars. There are planets of all shapes and sizes. It's quite remarkable. Even the nearest star to Earth, Proxima b, in the Alpha Centauri triple star system, that has its own world orbiting it. And just this last week, we've heard about Ross 128, which has an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone 11 light years away. Democritus was right in those three statements so far. The last statement that survives, that he made, was that many of these worlds out there would be dead and barren and empty, but many will be filled with life. In the next 10 years, we will be able to see if Democritus was right or not. We can't obviously go there today because we don't have the technology, but we can observe life on the surfaces of these worlds by looking for biosignatures. Biosignatures are molecules that wouldn't be present in the atmospheres of worlds if those worlds didn't have life. Here's an example. We have Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And those graphs show the sunlight that's passed through the atmospheres of these planets. And some of the molecules in the atmosphere have blocked the sunlight, and you get those dips. So you see all these worlds have carbon dioxide, but only the Earth has ozone there, very prominent, which comes from free oxygen, and water too. So oxygen is a biosignature of life. It's produced by living things. If there was no life on Earth, there would be no oxygen in its atmosphere. At the moment, our telescopes are just not big enough to detect these biosignatures in other worlds. But coming online, we have these remarkable instruments. And they're going to look at this effect. When the planets pass in front of their stars, some of the starlight will pass through their atmospheres, they will measure the spectrum and search for those chemicals that would indicate life. These are the instruments that are coming online. We have the Next Generation Space Telescope, the James Webb Telescope, with its six-meter gold-plated mirror. That's going to be launched in just two years. And then we have this remarkable telescope from the European Southern Observatory, with its 40-meter mirror. Those are cars to scale in front of the observatory there. With these telescopes, we can find if there is oxygen in the atmospheres of these other worlds. We've already actually detected water 
on some planets, but oxygen is harder. And there are other molecules we can look for, such as nitrous oxide from decaying plants, methyl chloride from fires, because only once living things can burn. So that would be a strong indicator of life. Or maybe life is sort of like ourselves and happily pollutes its atmosphere, and we can detect the chlorofluorocarbons in their worlds. So Democritus, I think, would be quite impressed by our discoveries. He might also ask the same question as many of us. Given all of these worlds out there, how come life hasn't already visited us? And I, I would be able to show him a picture of a UFO because the CIA just declassified its database of UFOs. And there are thousands of terrible images like this from the 60s. And, um, unfortunately, that's the best I have to show to Democritus, even though today we have a, a billion high-resolution smartphone cameras around the world, still no one good picture of a UFO or an alien. <laughs> and you know, this, is, this is known as the Fermi paradox, and I think I've uncovered the answer to the why intelligent life is leaving us alone, and we haven't seen it yet, and uh, I will leave you with... The last image. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>